Welcome to the European Heart Journal today. Uh, welcome to the Davos Cardiology uh, Update. Uh, my name is Christian Matter. I'm professor of cardiology at the University of Zurich. Uh, I focus on atherosclerosis and uh, acute coronary syndrome. I'm very honored and pleased to have Professor Herbert Schunkert from Munich with me. He's a professor in chief of cardiology in Munich. He's a world top expert in cardiovascular genetics with uh, excellent uh, contributions in the top journals such as New England Journal, Science, Nature, Genetics, Nature. Hey, about uh, welcome to this meeting. Could you perhaps sum up the three key tools uh, and uh, findings in cardiovascular genetics over the last couple of years? Well, um, about 10 years ago, I was working with some fellows and we were studying really hard, looking at families, collecting more and more individuals with coronary artery disease and trying to find new reasons, new genetic reasons for coronary disease. And, and one fellow got impatient and she said, now we are studying this for so many years and we haven't found a single genetic cause for coronary artery disease. I'm going to move to some other field. So that was 10 years ago. And now, after this short period of time, we have discovered 100 loci in the human genome that all carry variants that modulate the risk of coronary artery disease. That means 100 different causes of coronary artery disease because they address different genes, different mechanisms, and they open a whole new field or what can be studied in terms of the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis, of coronary artery disease, and the prevention of coronary artery disease. To me, this is overwhelming. It is a big luck to work at a time when uh, new technologies become available to us and make us, uh, bring us in the pos position to make these discoveries. And it's fascinating, really, to work in this field. So you really proved that atherosclerosis is a polygenic disease. What were the key technical advancements that allowed in the past 10 years to go at that speed uh, in development and research? So the first step was, of course, that the human genome was sequenced. The second step was that many individuals were sequenced and people discovered that we all are different at millions of spots that is single nucleotide polymorphisms or small exchanges in the genome. And the third step was that it was possible or became possible to study millions of these genetic variants at a time in a single individual at low cost and to associate them with disease. That means to study thousands of patients, thousands of healthy individuals, compare these millions of variants and then make these discoveries. So it was the new technology of genome-wide association studies that brought us in the position to discover all these small different changes in the genome that make a difference when it comes to the risk of atherosclerosis. Superb. Uh, in these uh, discoveries you've done, the one that fascinates you the most, uh, could you quickly uh, tell us what it is and why? Probably the very first discovery that we made in 2007, uh, that is a locus at chromosome 9, P21, that harbors no genes in the first place, but has an Im enormous risk increase. So one allele increases the risk of coronary disease of about 25%. Mm -hmm. um, the chances that we carry one risk allele is about 100% uh, on, on average because the chance to have two is, is, is 25%. The chance, the chance to have zero a risk allele is, is, is about 25%, but most people carry one risk allele that increases the risk of 25%. So, so the risk is frequent, uh, the risk is fairly high, uh, and the mechanism now becomes to evolve. It, it is a non-coding RNA that either is uh, longitudinal or circular. Yeah. The circular one seems to be protective. The other one seems to increase risk. 
and the protection comes from modulation of gene expression uh, and the affection of, of many genes that are slightly modulated. So, so it's a totally new mechanism that is frequent, that is important, and that gives new insights in the biology of atherosclerosis. Sounds super interesting. Uh, precision medicine is this uh, new idea that we're all very fascinated with. Could you sketch perhaps a little bit the contribution of genetics in this whole area? Where do you see it to go in the next couple of years? So the one uh, information is perhaps a bit disappointing. Because first when we thought that we, can, that we know all these variants, we can be perhaps more precise in predicting risk for an individual. But then we learned that all of us carry one or the other risk variants. A few people carry more. Of course, they have a higher risk. And others carry a lower number. They have a lower risk. But the difference is not really so enormous in most individuals to say on the spot, you will get or you, you will develop coronary disease and, and you won't. So here the precision isn't that good as we hoped it to be. But uh, it may be that if one carries some variants that are potentially modulated by simple means, for example aspirin, uh, then of course it could be enorm uh, in, uh, very helpful to know which of these variants is prevalent in, in one or the other uh, individuals. Uh, individual. For example, we discovered quite a few who affect platelet function, mm -hmm. and we already have indication that those who have variants that affect platelet function and increase risk of coronary disease have a particular benefit from aspirin treatment. So here precision medicine mm -hmm. could be really uh, coming up soon uh, once we have proved uh, uh, that, that this uh, will actually be of uh, benefit in, in a population uh, uh, like, like ours. So there is a, uh, an advantage of pharmacogenomics perhaps in this uh, area where we have an advantage if we know all the genome uh, that is probably readily available but we have to uh, look at that with a, a lot of caution and uh, knowing the environmental factors evidently contribute to the disease in the end as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, all these genetic discoveries do not take away from the environmental factors. Yeah. So it's still, I mean, the first thing to do to have a healthy lifestyle because no matter what the genetic risk is, a healthy lifestyle is beneficial. And mm -hmm. actually what we learned, if somebody is unfortunate, to carry many risk alleles. A healthy lifestyle is even more important because the absolute lowering of risk by a healthy lifestyle is the highest in those who are unfortunate to have the highest genetic risk. So that still would be a very cost-effective strategy to go uh, along that avenue. Right, because it's ed additive. Yeah, we are coming towards an end. Could you perhaps uh, wrap up in uh Three key statements, your most important uh, message to uh, our audience? Well, the, the first thing is that we have made wonderful discoveries in a relatively short period of time, the last 10 years, because of these new, these new technologies. We still have to learn how to use this new information for better individualized prediction and better individualized treatment. But I'm still very much hoping and even more optimistic that we are on the right track and we will get there in a foreseeable period of time. Uh, sounds very, very attractive. Thank you very much, Harry. It was a pleasure talking to you and uh, thanks for sharing your insight with us. Thank you very much.